Welcome to the Grazing Grass Podcast, Episode 3. I try to manage the pastures more so for field condition rather than like if the animals are done grazing. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping you produce forages for livestock grazing. Stay tuned and join our community at grazinggrass.com. Welcome back. I'm Cal Hardich, host of the Grazing Grass Podcast, and on today's episode, we have Ben Hepler. He is a wonderful guest. He didn't even complain when someone, may have been me, forgot to click the record button. But let's get past that and get started on the interview. Ben, welcome to the Grazing Grass Podcast. We're excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your farm and your operation and yourself? Yep. So um, we have a cow-calf operation um, as a whole family, so it includes my myself, my younger brother, uh, my dad, and my grandfather. We all pitch in. Um, so we have a commercial cow herd, and then I, I have a purebred red pole herd uh, that I manage, and um, everything is... Um, born on the farm and we raise it up and finish it on the farm so we're a um, cow calf to finishing operation which is which is which is fun Um, and then we also direct market all of that beef uh, for the freezer trade so we uh, which is nice so 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 customers know exactly what they're getting and they don't have to question you know the oranges of their beef and stuff like that Tell us where you're located and your climate. Yep, so I'm located in the northeast corner of Pennsylvania. Um, as someone told me one time at a at a at a at, a, at an ag conference, um, we live 45 minutes north of Scranton, and their response was, <laughs> "There's farms north of Scranton." <laughs> oh, yes. It's like, yeah, there's there's still Pennsylvania above Scranton. Um, but uh, we're the last exit on Interstate 81 before you get into New York State, so we're right in the northern northern tier of PA, and uh, we actually have hay fields in the southern tier of New York, so we straddle the border quite oh. a bit. Um, and the climate is probably uh, temp- humid temperate, so we experience all four seasons, and uh, generally speaking, we get about, I think, 40 inches of precipitation a year and that that includes snow um but if but as i was saying uh if if we go a couple weeks without any precip um we we start to get into some drought droughty conditions unless you know there's a spring seep somewhere that that keeps things wet oh yes yeah. what when's your average date of your last frost and then first frost. I actually good have question, that up huh? right now. Um, <laughs> oh, do you? Oh, very <laughs> so, good. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> so, so in the last, I think, let's see here. I think the period of record is 15 years. So in the last 15 years, our last, our last frost, or yeah, our last frost in the spring is about June 2nd. And our first frost in the fall in the last fifteen years would be like September twelfth. Oh wow! You a very abbreviated season from what I'm used to. Our yep. our last frost in our area is typically the first week in April, and then the okay. first frost is usually around the first week in November, give or take yeah. a little. Generally, so. generally speaking, if we can get our garden planted, um. I mean, we had corn in the fifth of May this year, you know. Oh yes. So I mean, it, it's just your risk of risk of frost. Um, right. But most of the time, it, if we get the garden in a week or so before Memorial Day, um, that's a, that's pretty much a safe bet, unless unless it's a cold a cold spring. Oh yeah. Yeah. We actually had six inches of snow. Uh, in the northern part of Delaware County, where I work, um, the middle of May. So, <laughs> which which is crazy for us because if we get six inches of snow for the winter, we think we're doing something. <laughs> oh wow! 
<laughs> yeah, we, we don't get no very five much. Five-foot snow drifts. <laughs> no. Now, occasionally we'll get more than that, but, but not typically. Yeah. I really don't know what the average amount. Do you guys have ice storms down there more often, though? We do. The ice is, is bad because if that rain comes in right around freezing and it drops just below freezing, it'll freeze the lines and stuff. Two, not two years ago, sorry. Probably, I don't know, eight to ten years ago, we had a terrible ice storm, and we were knocked out electric electricity for two weeks. So that wasn't oh, wow. much fun. No. But the ice, the ice is a big concern. Yeah, and see, we don't get much of that. Oh, yes. I'm told yeah. that our snow is a little bit wetter than the snow up north. But I okay. don't know. No. Yeah. <laughs> Beats me. <laughs> so on the forages on your farm, what kind of forages do you have? So our whole farm is uh, is all cool season grasses, um, cool season perennial grasses, and then most of our legumes are um, our clovers. Generally speaking, our, our farm is, is mostly somewhat poorly drained in terms of soil type. Oh, so, yes. so like alfalfa doesn't really work too well, uh, cause it likes its, its roots, you know, feet dry. Um, oh, yes. and so for cool season, it, it's a makeup of Timothy, uh, orchard grass, reed canary grass, uh, blue grass. There's probably some brome. I see a couple sprigs of of ryegrass when I'm looking for it. Um, oh yeah, and then your white and red clover. Is the white clover and the red clover your predominant clovers in the area? Yep, and then there's the. Oh, well, I think white clover also spreads through rhizomes, but there's one that. Um, but yes, the short answer. Yes. Is, is yes. Those are the two predominant types of clover in the area. Now, do you ever plant anything or or add anything yep. to your pastures or hay? So, <clears throat> in the on the property where I have my red pole cattle, um, we did experiment interseeding oats last fall just for fun to see if if it would grow with the with the existing sod. Um, and it did. I wasn't able to stockpile it for as long as I wanted, so the cows did graze it off when it was probably uh, six six inches tall or so. Um, but in the past, we've we've experimented planting uh, millet if we if we knew we had enough lead time um, for the cows to graze it, and not just graze it as it was seedlings. Um, but most of the time, when we're experimenting with inner seedings. Um, We'll do warm season grass such as like sedan grass in our hay fields. Um, oh yes. And depending depending on the health of the sod, because we don't we try not to spray or, or till it till anything. Um, it, it does come up variable, but it is it's it definitely gives an insight of the type of growth relationship that comes about when you when you try to inter, introduce something into into an established sod. Um, yes. Do you? So you mentioned stockpiling or or trying to a little bit. Do you? Do you do much yep. stockpiling of forages? Not, not too, not not really. Um, our our falls or autumn, I guess. Um, they they have a tendency to become real wet, and where my water lines are at at, at the other farm, uh, they're all above ground. So by the end of October, I'm kind of out of business because the below bl- the the low temperature in in the end of October starts to get below freezing. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Um, I try to I try to manage the pastures um, more so for field condition um, rather than like if the animals are done grazing. Or have eaten what I consider to be oh, yes. what they should have taken, um, just because of how wet some of our our fields are. And so, do you you rotate your cattle fairly often, or how do you do yep. that? Um, so depends on the group. I 
I <laughs> I watch a lot of Greg Judy's uh, YouTube videos, and uh, <laughs> I do too. And uh, you know, he's got that one big herd, and yes, it does make a lot of sense because you do expend just about as much um, work moving ten cows as it does to move, you know, fifty. At least in, in oh, my yes. at my place, I, I can't compare it to four hundred because I've never moved four hundred cattle. But <laughs> right, um, me either. <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, at basically the, the rotation is w- we try to move our cows every, every two to four days. Um, we've okay. noticed that, uh, our grass starts to regrow if the moisture's there. Um, we'll start pushing new shoots about that third or fourth day. Um, and so to prevent them from back grazing, um, we will keep them moving along and, and if we can if, if if it's reasonable to do so without running out of tapes and stuff uh, temporary tapes and stuff um, we'll do a back fence so that way they can't oh yes they literally can't go back to where they were right right unless they push the tape down <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love solar yes, fence huh? chargers <clears throat> oh that's true and that was my next question was <laughs> about what kind of fence charger you have in your fencing what do you use for your fencing? So, um, here at this other farm, I have a Parmac, um, like number 12 or some, something like that. Oh, and yes. it does a great job when the sun's out and and it's dry. Um, I'll, I'll be pushing 5,000 volts of electricity going through it. Um, oh, yes. And I have about two or three miles worth of electric fencing on it, so it's quite a bit. I, oh um, yeah, for for such a small charger, uh, but as soon as it rains and I it rains or if it's a cloudy day for a couple of days, um, it it you know it's kind of hoping that the cows just respect the fence because they have <laughs> grass in front of them and they don't feel like searching right. for stuff. Um, the calves don't respect anything, um, and for the first couple of years, I only had one strand of temporary along the dirt road. And uh, I was getting calls all the time. Your cows oh, are yes. out. It's like, well, are the cows out or are they like smaller? Because <laughs> if they're smaller, I'm right. less concerned. Um, it, but yeah, it, luckily they're only along the road for a week, and so it's just oh, a week yes. of headache. But um, but then at the main farm we have uh, plug-in chargers. Uh, we have three of them split up between the farm. Oh yes. And what kind of chargers do you have there? Um, we had well, we had a speed right, and then that got struck by lightning. So now, right now, there's a Gallagher in place of that at the moment. Oh, yeah. um, and then the two other locations are both Ken Cove chargers. Oh yeah. Um, yep, they're a, they're a company in Pennsylvania. I think they have a another warehouse in Indiana also. Um, I I purchased a few things from Ken Cove. Yeah, that they worked out good for me, but yeah, they are in Pennsylvania. Now, when you're you're moving your cattle, you're doing one strand of wire, poly tape, poly wire. Yes. Or you're using some high <laughs> tensile. <laughs> so, 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 generally now for our perimeters, we have either um, barbed wire, and then if if I got creative, I have a, a single strand of electric wire in between the barbs so I could hook up my temporary oh, um, yes. to get electric from. Uh, as, in terms of temporary fencing, we, we have t- we have tape, poly braid, and poly wire. We, we've tried all three. Oh, so. yes. <laughs> and do you have a preference? Um, I like the poly braid, um, although with how I... My herd of red pole cattle is only a, is a herd of 20. Um... So the paddocks I make are quite small, and so I don't have to walk that far uh, to to make oh, yes. a paddock. Um, so the the pre the the pre uh, pre wound uh, small reels from Ken Cove with the 660 feet of you know the cheap oh, three yes. strands of poly wire for twenty dollars. It's hard to it's hard to beat. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Um, 
but but for longevity and for brake strength, uh, the poly braid is definitely nice. Um, but for visibility, the poly tape is is definitely the best. Um, but but definitely snaps a lot easier, and then strands go everywhere yeah. <laughs> when the cows run through it. Oh yes. Now I'm curious. So you've got red pole cows, and you also have a commercial yep. herd of what breeding. So it's it's mostly black Angus, um, and then uh, we actually have a, we've had a Hereford bull the last couple of years, also. So we got some black baldies, um, but then if you go back through the cow families, um, there's some Charlay, some Shorthorn, oh yes, and some quite a bit of Devon, um, rolling oh, around yes. in there. Now, do you notice a difference in your commercial cows versus your red pole cows with the respect to the electric fence? Um, it's about the same. Yes. I will say that I, I, um, when I first started over here, the, um, it actually used to be a hay field and I, I asked my grandfather if we could convert it to pasture. So we, we went ahead and put a bunch of poly wire up and I didn't want to have to deal with gates. And I also didn't want to have to deal with going and turning the charger off all the time so I actually trained my cows to step over the wire when it was electrified oh yes yeah <laughs> so so sometimes they respect it less just in case for some reason if they bump into it in a in a in a, in a temporary fence post falls for some reason um, they have no problem exploring and walking back <laughs> over right. it to go go places um, uh, but generally, they they both respect them fairly well, um, unless, for instance, we had a a yearling heifer group um, that ended up three miles from the farm, uh, and we think a, a bear or something scared them. Oh yes, because uh, they it took them about a month to finally respect the electric fence um, instead of oh, running yes. through it all the time. Yeah. yeah, just from how skittish they became. Oh, yes, I imagine so. I'd be pretty skittish, so I understand them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, for your temporary post, what are you using for that? Um, so we use the uh, pigtail um, uh, step-in fence post. Oh, yes. Um, I like those the best. They do get tangled because of the, because of the foot at the bottom, but um, all in all, I'm, I've been happy with them. I do... I have switched to, I I have put um, like the rod post insulators on the shaft of the pigtail to put in right. another strand um, to try to keep those calves from getting out onto the road and stuff like that, which yes. that has helped. Um, and I thought about getting a few of the um, uh, New Zealand style multiple strand step-in oh, yes. posts that that like for instance Greg Judy uses um but when I was ordering through Ken Cove um the ones from New Zealand were all sold out at the time and I just wasn't ready to pay for shipping from from elsewhere in the country oh yes yeah and that's understandable i have a few of those pigtails and i ha- i've got cattle and sheep so i just run one wire and the sheep just kind of pick where they want to go but i've thought about getting some of those that go on that shaft so i can run multiple wires i've also got some step in o'brien's also yep now during during winter you you've got a long winter do you i'm I'm just curious how you manage them during winter so you pin them up and feed hay to them how is that what you do? Do you yep. still try and rotate them some, or is it too wet? So if we can, <clears throat> if we can keep the ice off the water troughs, you know, consistently, or if I have like a continuous flow water trough that um, it doesn't freeze until it gets, you know, like twenty six or so out, um, we have kept our yearling group out until the middle of December before, um, but we're fortunate. Uh, we have some projects that got implemented through the NRCS. So we have uh, two manure storages and a concrete barnyard and uh, two big pole barns. And actually we have an old dairy barn 
where we keep our calf group. Um, oh yes. So they all come in, and then and we spread manure every weekend and and feed every couple of days. Um, so it's quite a bit of hay. We make about 800 round bales a year to, oh, to yes. feed everybody. Yeah, making that hay and feeding it gets to be its own job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and then for fun, you got to make a couple square bales, too, just you know, just because you have nothing better <laughs> just, to do when it's 95 out. Yes, just to stay in good practice. My my dad was complaining uh, when we had our hay baled that we didn't have any square bales so he could go get my nephews so they could learn how to haul square bales. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely an appreciation, but... I'm I'm kind of oh, yeah. I'm kind of lucky. I I have an accumulator, a coon a coon accumulator, and uh, so I can at least bale everything and load it onto wagons with just myself and a tractor. Oh yes. Um, and then, but I still have to hand unload it into the into the barn. But at least that right. can be done in the evenings when everybody else is off of work. Um, oh yes. I had a an older square baler that had a chute just long enough to. Uh, to get it onto the wagon, so I would I would bale a windrow, and then get off the tractor, go stack it, <laughs> bale another oh, windrow, yes. get off the wagon, go you know get off the tractor, go stack it. Right. That gets old kind of quick though. Oh, I I I completely understand. I haven't worked that hard with a we, you know, one of my best days in my farming history is when we got rid of the haying equipment and we started paying somebody to do it. Yeah. I I wish we could do that sometimes. But. I know every year we we get a little um irritated because the custom baler is not here when we want him here. That's um he wants it to be completely dry and we're like we think we've got enough dry days. Let's try. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned earlier on your paddocks you've got above ground water lines. Tell us a little bit about your watering yeah. system. So that one's unique because I, I put that all in myself. Um, I didn't. I had streams at the. So I don't own the property where my red poles are grazing. I, I lease it from from a um, a landowner, and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to try to take care of his his property the best way I could. So if I ever had to leave, he would never know that the cows had been there. Um, so. Uh, fortunately, he his father had dug a pond halfway up the mountainside that's fed by a spring that runs year round. And oh so yes. I have about yeah I have about three thousand feet of three quarter inch black uh, black plastic pipe um, just just strewn on on top of the ground, and then I have um, I have hydrants, but really they're just they're just capped uh, cam lock quick connect uh, couplers. And then when I need to go, I, I put my water trough there. I take the cap off and I plug in um, to my water trough. Oh, so yes. So that way I can... So I have multiple hookup areas, but I only have two two troughs to deal with because um, the Gallagher float valve is quite expensive. So if I could get a bunch of hookups and not have to deal with... I thought about the, the Plasin, uh, plastic you know, auto shutoff and yes. quick coupler... Um, but because uh, I go right from black plastic to the hook up at the trough, um, there are, is some hoof action on that on that pipe, and oh, uh, yes. I was worried I'd break the plastic connector um, of that plastic. Um, so I, I I I chose an aluminum one inch aluminum cam cam fitting uh, to to hook up to my trough. Oh yes. And do you put so, one trough in each paddock, and then you have two so you yep. can alternate them, or do you put two in each and move them each day um, or a few days? So, yeah, yes. <laughs> 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 I do all that. Uh, yes. It just it depends. So because my farm is so wet, um, I have a section of pasture that has a low spot in the middle, and the paddock in that instance is only maybe 100 feet wide um, between the two troughs. But if they get thirsty, and I'd rather have them stay to one side and drink instead of tracking back through, oh um, yes, and 
and having to travel to that other, even though it's so close, um, I wanted to give them the, the most flexibility to try to keep uh, field pugging to a to a minimum. Oh yes. Uh, but generally, I I'll uh, I'll hook up and use that trough for a little while, and then if if I have another trough that I just don't feel like going to get, or if it's too far away, I'll just unplug it quick, put the cap in, and just dump. It's they're they're only 100 gallon um, rubber made troughs. So they're easy to yes. flip over by myself, and then I'll just drag it to the next hookup um, and plug it in for the for the cattle. Oh yes, on the cattle you mentioned you your the commercial herd, and then you have your red polled herd. Why'd you go with the red pole yep. for your purebred herd? <laughs> um, that that was a journey that started back when I was in eighth grade. So I'm 27 now. Um, and I went to a grazing conference in Williamsport, PA, uh, when I was in eighth grade and, uh, met a couple from two towns over from my county, in, in my county. And she was talking up how these red pole cattle were so great and they grass, you know, I could finish them on grass and, you know, they're a heritage breed, so no one has them. And so I thought, Ooh, no one has them. I like to be different. And <laughs> yes, yes. And so I bugged my grandfather for, for two years. And we finally we bought some uh we bought two heifers two heifer calves the following the following year um and then they stayed in business for a while so every, when they be when the two heifer calves were ready to breed, I took them over, bred them, got oh, two yes. more heifer calves, took oh, them over, good. bred them, <laughs> got two more heifer calves yes um by that time they had sold out, and so i I actually had the opportunity i I bought their herd um used one of their bulls for a year. Um, I had another gentleman up in the Catskills of New York, um, actually where I ended up working for my job now, um, and I bought his herd as well. So, um, Oh, yes. I'm done buying everybody's herds. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to build <laughs> yeah. my own now. Um, but I, I kind of, you know, the Devon does a really good job for grass finishing. Um, right. Because I, I had seen that because we had used a Devon bull for a while. I didn't like the fact that every now and then we had to, um, the horned gene kind of presented itself. Oh, right. And so you had to deal with them. Um, it was interesting to me that these cattle marketed themselves as being able to finish on grass, but in their history had been a dual purpose breed for dairy and beef. Right, yes. Um, and I have pictures both on Facebook and in my you know old livestock history books from like 1915 <laughs> oh, yes. that uh, show them and you know they look like a fattened ready ready for harvest animal but they're producing 11,000 pounds of milk a year oh um, yes. <laughs> <so> <laughs> yes it's just it was funny um, I will say that because of that dairy uh, gene or I don't. It's not a gene, but trait. I guess I would call it. Um, sometimes some of the animals don't fatten on grass as as I'd like them to. Oh yes. Um, but through partnering with other other breeders, um, I, I I I get my sires from a guy in in North Carolina, um, and that's been working quite well for kind of oh, yes. changing my trajectory towards towards being an all grass finished herd. Oh yes. The the red pole breed has always fascinated me, and it it started yeah. at a similar time for me. It was high school, and a dairy production book from the '40s showed all these red pole cows, and I'm like, what? And we had a dairy, so I've been fascinated by red pole. And I've told my wife we're going to buy some red pole heifers, but I haven't quite done it yet. But I'm hoping to in the future. Yeah, yeah, they're they're fun. I mean, they they're um. They're definitely a lot less excitable. If you keep them together as a group, they're a lot less excitable, I think, than Black Angus. However, oh, yes. those two foundation cows of mine were were intermingled with my commercial herd, and you know they became as excitable as oh, the right. Black Angus in in our in our herd. So you know, just 
herd mentality. <laughs> right, right. I understand that. But, um, but definitely, you know, if you go see them every day or every other day, that keeps them kind of. Uh, it's amazing how cows pick up on pattern. Oh yes. Um, and are and are so nice and so used to just a scheduled routine. Um, even even changing a side by side because you use one side by side to move, and you use a different one to tag calves, they'll know that that different side by side is there to catch a calf and not to move, <laughs> and everybody everybody scatters. Oh so yes. That's uh, so you you have to constantly remind them that you know pieces of equipment or even the way you do things can be so interchanged that they have to kind of just be ready for anything. <laughs> oh, you, yes, <laughs> and, right. And that, <laughs> um, which is a lot of fun. Well, Ben, we've enjoyed this conversation, and we'd like to, we've got our famous four questions. And I listen to the Bigger Pockets um, podcast, and they have the last four questions the same for their podcast for each one. So we have our four questions. Our first one's, what's your favorite related uh, grazing grass related book or resource or tool. It, I'm actually sitting right next to my my bookcase right now, so I have to like look at all the <laughs> <laughs> look at them all. Um, I'm always excited to so hear I've, a bookcase. <laughs> so I've read. I'm probably inverted right here. So if I show the book, it'll be backwards. But um, a book I read two years ago was Fertility Pastures. Um, by a gentleman in England. Oh yes, his, and his name was Newman Turner. Um, and that was—that's what it looks like. Yeah, it's backwards. Um, oh yes, that was a lot of fun. He was—he—he he was a dairyman. Um, that uh, was all was all grass purely for the sake of cost. Um, but I've also read Quality Pasture by. Uh, by Alan Nation, and I really appreciated that that book as well. So, those are probably my two favorite so far. Um, oh, very good. I mean, I can't. I could go on. I can't rule out Joel Salatin because I actually <laughs> did a book report uh, on salad bar beef in ninth grade. Uh, oh yes. I came to the teacher. And I said, I said, can I do? The, can I read this book? She said, if you can find foreshadowing, you know, all these liter, you know, literature. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, well, right. I don't want to say alliteration because that's that's not really. But you, ha- yes. you had had to, it couldn't just be a textbook. And so right. I went through the book and I, I found all three of them. I said, "Here they are." <laughs> she was fine. <laughs> yes. Ben, do do there you do go. What yes. You gotta do. <laughs> that's wonderful. I mean, it helped that Joel. I think I think he majored in English anyway. You know, early yes. on, so he, you know. He's a book grader from from the get go. Oh yes, his writing style would fit that. Yes. Yeah. Our next question: What tool could you not live without on the farm? Could not live without. Without adding undue stress and irritation from adding infrastructure, is that? Because <laughs> temp- temporary fencing, I think, would be the one thing that I could probably not do without, just because of how flexible it is if you change herd size you can change pasture size oh yes um if you know it's going to rain the next day you can fence out a wet area i mean the the flexibility that temporary electric fencing gives you when used properly is uh is an amazing is an amazing tool to, to oh, have yeah. when you were beginning your journey as becoming a grass farmer um, what do you know now you wish you'd known then I started my journey. Well, it's tough because um, <laughs> I've had this journey since I was 10. Um, oh, I actually yes. have a photo of myself in 2002 standing amongst a bunch of guys that in their 60s and 70s staring at a water trough that we had just put in on the farm. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> to, to do rotational grazing. So um, in terms of honing the skill, though... Um, Learning the difference between what is overgrazed and what a 
and what isn't when you're dealing with tall grass. I think that that has helped me immensely. So what, oh, what yes. might look like the cows have have just stepped it all down and didn't eat anything sometimes is actually when you're supposed to move them cuz it'll rebound so quickly. Um Oh, yes. That 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 tromped over mature grass, you know, wasn't helping you in the first place. Right. Yeah. Very good. Where can others find out more about you? So I I do have a Hepler Beef Facebook page. Um, it's different than Hepler Meats. That's that's our long distant cousins from on the other side of the state, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who do almost the exact same thing. Um, oh, but they yes. have their own butcher shop. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm Hepler Beef, and uh, and I I post things from time to time, um, and. Uh, that's that's probably the best way to 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 find out more and and learn learn what we do here in the endless mountains of Pennsylvania. Wonderful. We'll we'll post a link to your Facebook page there in our show notes. And Ben, we appreciate you being on our podcast. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well this was fun. This was my first ever podcast to <laughs> to to attend and be be the person speaking with it. So, thank you. This is the Grazing Grass Podcast. Helping you produce forages for livestock grazing. Be sure to join our community at grazinggrass.com. Yeah, I am sorry. That's okay. We'll run through all that again. (laughs) Don't worry, I can talk for hours. Ben, welcome to the Grazing Grass podcast. (laughs) Actually, maybe I should. I think think the intro was recorded. It's what I'll do Was is it? this. Did I bump it and turn it off? Well, either way, you you can do the intro. I'll so that way I don't laugh. I will. I I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do I'll do it again, and then we'll get we'll we'll go through that. <laughs> <laughs>